Okay, so today we are hopping back into the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to look at a story uh, between Jesus and this mother. And it's probably one of the most confusing and for some people troubling stories in all of the Gospels when you look at Jesus. It's the story of this mother from a, mother, a, a neighboring nation who comes to Jesus and begs him to help her sick daughter. And Jesus' response to her seems harsh, cold. It goes against this picture of what we'd have of Jesus, and it causes us to ask, like, what's going on here? Why would he do this? Is Jesus Jesus I've heard about? It's, this, count, this encounter is so jarring that it's led people in recent times to suggest that Jesus is uh, racist and has to unlearn uh, prejudices. And so uh, that question is at work for some people as they read this, but things are not always as they seem. And what I want to do today is read through the passage, try to explain what's at work, how people have tried to make sense of it, uh, and then highlight what I think is the most compelling explanation, and, and then from there, maybe seek to draw out an implication or two. Okay, so this is the passage. It's Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 21, and we'll read all the way through to 28. And so this is what it says. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus didn't answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. And he replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And the daughter was healed at that moment. Our Father in heaven, we come before you. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and we ask that you would grant us wisdom and understanding as we read through this passage and seek to make sense of it. And we ask that you would speak to us, that we would see your son as he really is, and that we would hear what it is you want us to hear today. And it's in his name we pray, amen. So what I want to try to do is walk through this a bit, like verse by verse, and uh, try to make sense of what, what Matthew is telling us in this story and then we'll get through how some people seek to make sense of it, okay? So, the story starts with Jesus withdrawing from the Galilee region, which was his Jewish home base. It's where he's doing his ministry. And he's going into this other region, this region of Phoenicia, where Tyre and Sidon were key cities. We're not exactly told why he retreats into this region. It could be that he wanted some peace and quiet from the crowds that seemed to be following him around the Galilee. It could be, uh, and it seems like this pretty likely at work that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are constantly accusing him and seeking to test him and put him in a bind. And so going into this area is providing a reprieve for him and his disciples. Either way, Jesus enters into this land and there's this Canaanite woman that comes to him. Israel had been living in this ongoing conflict with the Canaanites. By this time in uh, history, the term Canaanite was no longer an ethnic term that was used regularly. The term that would have been uh, more appropriate would have been Syrophoenician. That's what Mark uses in his account of this. Matthew uses Canaanite then intentionally. The Canaanites were Israelites' most insidious and persistent rivals. They were, there was a century-long battle that they had over the land rights that Israel and the Canaanites were fighting in. And the Canaanites were idolatrous. They worshipped uh, many gods. They had terrible worship practices. And throughout Israel's history, they had been tempted and then drawn into those practices of worship and worshipping these other gods. Because of this conflict, the Old Testament prophets, they had condemned Tyre and Sidon in particular. And so when Matthew mentions that there's this Canaanite woman, that Jesus has entered into this region near Tyre and Sidon. He's trying to drop all these hints to this first audience. Matthew's audience would have been predominantly Jews, Jews who've embraced Jesus as the Messiah. And they know these references. And so they understand some, that something's at work here, that Jesus is entering into maybe like hostile territory, unwelcome territory, the territory that would have been seen at, at that time as maybe more like bitter enemies. 
And G- Matthew is saying that this woman is coming to Jesus, and she's supposed to be one of his bitter rivals, and yet she is coming to him and saying, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Here's a mother who's crying out to Jesus, and the word uh, that's cr- that uh, is found in the Greek for this crying out, it's really like, it's conveying, it's speaking way too loudly. That you're pretty much yelling and calling towards Jesus for help. And it's not just how she speaks to Jesus that gets your attention, it's what she says. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Lord was this universal title. It, was, uh, it seems it's more likely that it's not just like a, uh, a, a term for honor here, especially because of what she says right after, son of David. This was a title for the Jewish Messiah, God's anointed king, who would bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. And he would finally deal with evil and sin, judge evil, and bring his restorative peace to the world. This is a term that Jewish people would have used for the Messiah, not outsiders. So somehow, this Canaanite woman, though she doesn't live in this land, she knows something about this Jesus. She's heard about what he does, who he is, and what other people, how they've described him. And she understands that he is called the son of David. Maybe it's possible uh, that she heard from Syrians who had uh, been healed at the very end of Matthew 4. And that's how she puts together what this is. We don't know how she heard. We just know that she does and that she comes to him. Now, this long-standing conflict between Israel and a, a Gentile is what Matthew is pointing to here in this encounter between Jesus and the Canaanite mother. And one of the things that comes up is what claim does she have to receive the compassionate ministry of Israel's Messiah? To you and I, on this side of the story of Scripture, that's not really a question. Gentiles are already included into the story of God. Gentiles meaning like non-Jews, all the other nations. But at this point, that's a question. By what right? She's a religious and social outsider. She would seemingly worship other gods. Matthew calls her a Canaanite. As far as the Old Testament is concerned, she can't approach God because she's unclean. She remains in sin, like all other Gentiles. She doesn't live by the covenant that God had made with Israel of old. But she comes to Jesus and she says, Lord, King, God's anointed one, have mercy on on me. My daughter is oppressed by a demon. This is a mother who's contending for the healing of her daughter, for her daughter's life. And she's tethered her well-being to her daughter's well-being. And she's saying, basically, Jesus, if there's anyone who can save my child, if there's anyone who can heal, restore them, if there's anyone who has the power to set her free from this evil, it is you. Have mercy. I know you are able. And how does Jesus respond? Well, it's kind of confusing. It doesn't really fit with how we think of Jesus. Verse 23 says, Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. Jesus answered, and you'll note, it doesn't tell us, because the Greek isn't clear, it doesn't tell us who he's answering. It doesn't say that he's saying it to his disciples or to her, it just says he's saying this. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. And the woman responds, yes, it is. Lord, even the dogs that eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your faith, your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Now notice the flow. It seems like he ignores her in verse 23. And the disciples are, are begging Jesus to send her away. They don't want him to minister to her, but they don't also want to hear her cries. Jesus says, you're not part of my mission. The focus of my mission is on the lost sheep of Israel, is implied. He says, then uh, it's not wise to help. That is foolish to give a br- the bread of children to dogs. And she actually says, no, it, it's not foolish. It, it, it is right. She insists, and then she actually puts herself into this illustration that Jesus uses. And then Jesus uh, responds and, and says, ah, your faith is great. And her daughter is healed in that moment. Now, this is where things feel challenging, right, as we, as we look at this. 
silence, not part of my mission, not right to give bread to her. The illustration he uses is comparing Israelites of old to children and her by extension and all Gentiles dogs. How how is that supposed to work? It doesn't seem like that fits how we want to understand and think of Jesus. And then Jesus finally does say, yeah, I will grant what you're asking me. Your faith is great. He seems to be here cold, distant, resists helping her because of her background, and then all of a sudden praises her for her faith. I should note that this Greek word that gets rendered dog in English could refer to a household pet, a dog, one that's part of the family, not like a wild street dog. Still, the animosity between Jews and Gentiles at this time was present enough that Jews would call Gentiles non-Jews dogs. It wasn't a compliment. Yet, for some reason, the disciples and this woman don't seem to be offended by what Jesus says. Either way, it doesn't read as this compassionate, kind Jesus that we would think of. So what's going on here? Why, why does Jesus seem to resist her request? That's one of the questions we're going to ask. Why does Jesus use this dog metaphor? And why does Jesus change his mind, or at least seemingly change his mind? So much has been written on this passage, both Mark and Matthew's accounts. There's so much debate centered on what Jesus is doing and why, and there's tons of diverging views. Even within different uh, camps, there's a ton of nuance. What I want to try to do is offer uh, three ways this has been interpreted. There's this guy's name's Colin Majek. He offers a helpful uh, synthesis of each three. Uh, Perhaps it's a little bit of a simplifying, but I think it's helpful just to kind of see where different groups uh, approach it. So this first interpretation is this. It's a unlearning of Jesus' cultural prejudices. In this view, Jesus is silent because of the cultural prejudices that other people, Jewish people had at that time are embedded in him. He has an ethnocentric bias in this view, where Jews are the priority and Gentiles are not to be part of this work. So he's human and fallible. And he uses the dog metaphor because that metaphor and way of thinking was dominant in the first century and was something that Jesus held to. Jesus thought that Canaanite woman was a second-tier citizen, and the worldview and traditions that Jesus grew up in were his too. Jesus changes his mind and heals her daughter because of her persistence. And she serves then to teach him, to help him unlearn this prejudice. Now, this view tends to assume uh, uh, a few things. One is that uh, being human implies sin and prejudice, and that Jesus was human and only human. And therefore, Jesus got it wrong here. And you cannot follow his example, and that he was fully trapped. That to be in his cultural moment also meant that he was trapped in his cultural moment and way of thinking. This view is not orthodox. It doesn't align with the rest of Scripture. Church tradition teaches us that Jesus indeed is fully human in every way like us, but without sin, the author of Hebrews tells us. That he's fully God. In this interpretation, though, we can't actually take and think that Jesus is the way. In fact, the way is that of this enlightened interpreter, the person who's making sense of it in this way. But more than that, I think there's actually a number of other issues. If you remove the, perhaps you could call it theological uh, side, when you look at this way of making sense of what's happening here, it it ignores a number of uh, things that are at work in Matthew's gospel. It ignores Jesus' interactions with non-Jews, like when Jesus heals a Roman centurion servant in Matthew 8. And then he heals two demon-possessed non-Jews in that same chapter at the end of it. You have to make sense of these interactions if you're going to apply this way of thinking that he's prejudiced there. Why would he be prejudiced here but not in these other situations? This perspective doesn't really address that. It also ignores uh, Jesus' mission to Israel, that God started his work with one family, the descendants of Abraham, and continues that work, but that was never the end. It was always that Israel would be like a light to the nations. This perspective seems to ignore that. It ignores this theme of bread that is at work. There's a slide that kind of helps you catch that. Um, A theme on bread. Oh, cool. Hi. So, chapter uh, 
In chapter 13, Jesus walks through these parables of the kingdom. And he touches on wheat, yeast, and flour. Then in chapter 14, Jesus feeds the 5,000 Jewish people with five loaves of bread. Chapter 15 comes in, and there's this debate about washing your hands and eating meals and what truly defiles you, Jesus says, isn't unclean hands, but what comes out of your heart. Then comes our story, this Canaanite woman and her daughter with bread and crumbs, that she's saying, look, there's enough bread for me too. Next, after this story, we read that Jesus feeds 4,000 non-Jews with seven loaves of bread. And then right after, in Matthew 16, we read of this debate that Andrew walked us through, debating this br- the, the bread and the leaven of the Pharisees. So there's this theme throughout this section of Matthew's gospel that's hitting on bread. What's at work here? Well, this perspective doesn't really seem to address that or acknowledge what's at work throughout the rest of the gospel. Bread seems to stand for the blessing of Jesus' ministry. Bread stands for the good news of the kingdom of heaven coming in Jesus. And Matthew is doing something here, and to ignore this misses what he's trying to convey. So you could could say, yeah, there's something off theologically about what this perspective thinks about Jesus, but I also think it's, it's not even like seeking to do justice to the rest of the gospel of Matthew and what the author is seeking to convey. There's enough bread for Jews and Gentiles. And this ministry of Jesus is for all, and the kingdom of heaven is for all to come to him. Unfortunately, this view just fails to take that narrative uh, seriously enough. Here's a second interpretation. It's an expansion of Jesus' understanding of God's will and his messianic mission. So in this view, why does Jesus resist her request? Jesus resists because it's not part of the Messiah's mission. He is committed to his mission to Israel, and then afterwards comes the rest of the world. Earlier in Matthew's gospel, Jesus tells his disciples when he sends them out on a mission, he says, look, do not go beyond Israel. Seek out only the lost sheep. You can read about it in Matthew 10. There's a clear clear focus on them. Why? Why? Well, it's simple. The Israelites were the ones waiting for the Messiah. They were the ones waiting. Gentiles weren't. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the way to being rightly related with God and others. And when Israel received the Messiah, they would be rescued, renewed, and then empowered to do the work of advancing the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus focuses his training and development on his disciples so that they would be ready to go and do this. And so the tension at work in Jesus is this. This is how one, uh, one guy, uh, Frederick Dale Bruner, put it. The bind is this. If Jesus heals the woman, the Gentile woman, might, the Gentile woman might come rushing in, and Jesus' concentrated mission to Israel will be diluted. For the way to the Gentiles is through, not around Israel. Or so Jesus has until now believed. So Jesus is wrestling with whether or not helping this woman would compromise his mission to Israel. And his use of the dog metaphor is not as offensive as we think. It's not a street dog. It's a family dog. It belongs in the household. It's offensive to us in our times, but not to them. It rubs us in that way, wrong in that way, but not necessarily for her or the disciples. So what changes Jesus' mind? He changes his mind because he's learned from this interaction with this woman and discovered the bigger picture of God's will and his messianic identity. I mean, we can see that there are other points throughout the Gospels where Jesus does come to God the Father and he's wrestling with his will. We see that in the Garden of Gethsemane. So it shouldn't be a surprise to us if he's fully human that he has to do that in other moments. This is how that view would seek to make sense of it. This view acknowledges that uh, that Jesus is both God and human, fully God, fully human. But as human, he has to learn over time the will of God for his life and his mission as Messiah. This is like, uh, for what it's worth, this perspective makes sense of a lot of the things that are at work in this account. And there are many followers, including uh, someone like Frederick Dale Bruner, who's super helpful making sense of the Gospel of Matthew, who fall into this camp. I think there's a lot that is true here. There are some things you maybe you could take issue with, and so I'll just highlight those. 
One is the trouble with this view is that it doesn't really make sense of Jesus' other interactions with non-Jews, the same ones I've mentioned. In particular, you can find them in Matthew 8. Um, it acknowledges that his ministry will come to include Gentiles, but it doesn't really address what's happened in these other encounters. And for some people, this view also seems to minimize the offensiveness of the metaphor that Jesus uses, uh, suggesting that it wasn't offensive at that time. And so that's not really, not, not everyone loves that, right? So those are a couple of things that uh, come up. Third interpretation. This is a moment that Jesus uses to instruct and to form his followers and to evoke a response of faith. So in this view, why is Jesus silent? It's because he's playing the part of a first century rabbi in order to make a point in order to teach his disciples and to evoke a response from this woman. Why does he use the dog metaphor? It's to embody a perspective that he doesn't hold, reflecting a common Jewish opinion. He's behaving the way a typical rabbi would have behaved, and thereby he's seeking to bring about a response from her. Now imagine when you're younger, you might have said to your friends when you were, uh, you Maybe you didn't really want to do something, but you wanted to see if they would do it. You'd say to them, I bet you can't climb that tree. What does your friend do? They get competitive, right? And they're like, no, I, I totally can climb that tree. And they go and do that. I do this with my children. I say, hey, I bet you, you guys cannot clean up this mess in less than a minute. Well, they, they show me. They prove me wrong, and I want to be proved wrong. I, they are provoked to show me that they can one modern retelling, though, of this that I read might be something like this. Jesus responds saying something of, surely it's the case that charity begins at home. And the woman responds saying, yes, Lord, but surely it also doesn't end there either. There are other places where Jesus challenges the norm to teach his disciples and those who come to him. One example of that can be found in Matthew 10. In verse 18, Jesus challenges a man who comes to him and calls him good teacher. Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, Jesus isn't trying to suggest that he should not be good here and that he isn't good. He's trying to bring about a response in this man. He's trying to teach him something. The guy is right. He just doesn't see how right he is. And he's trying to teach him that. New Testament scholar R.T. France, he says this, he says, a good teacher may sometimes aim to draw out a pupil's best insight by a deliberate challenge, which does not necessarily represent the teacher's own view. Even if the phrase devil's advocate may not be appropriate in this context, he, he suggests that there's something like that. He's holding to a perspective he doesn't fully hold to. He's articulating that because he wants to bring about a response in her. That's what Jesus does with this woman. She's got it right. He is the Lord. He is the son of David. The disciples are there, and they are thinking, man, this woman is annoying. Send her away. She's loud, and she doesn't even have claim to what you are bringing. And Jesus is articulating that view, and he's like, you've got it right. And he's giving her an opportunity to show him and those around her, that she believes he's the one. Now, nah, this, this king, this kingdom isn't for you. Wink. Yes, it is. It is. And he's good. It's not right to give bread to the dogs. Yes, it is. And it's as if she clings to who she believes him to be, saying, no, I know that this king is good. Charity begins in the king's home, but it doesn't end in his home. Your goodness extends beyond there. In this view, Jesus then doesn't change his mind. He grants her request when he sees the response he was trying to bring out of her, one of faith in her, in him. And when he does, he says, woman, your faith is great. Like the Roman centurion in Matthew 8, whose faith made Jesus marvel, we see that it's Gentiles and not the people of Israel whose faith is causing him to rejoice. And in so doing, Jesus condemns this way of thinking and relating that is prejudiced against other nations. 
He also brings about judgment on this view that excluded the other nations from the kingdom of heaven. If the Canaanite rivals could enter in and have access to the king, all the other nations can too. It teaches his disciples that there is indeed enough bread in his kingdom for all nations. And it reveals that the basis for entry into this kingdom is faith in him. Now, one weakness in this view is that it may feel like it seeks to reduce the tension of this encounter by saying that Jesus seems to be testing her. However, we've seen that God tests his people before. Perhaps the most uh, blatant example is Israel. When God leads them in the wilderness, and we're told to test them and know what was in their hearts, to know whether or not they would trust him wholeheartedly. He knows already what's in their heart. It's not like he is trying to figure that out. But the testing reveals it to them and to others, and it forms them as they learn to trust him. A second critique of this view might be that it seems to undermine the importance of the Messiah's mission to Israel. And I'd suggest that given the fact that he focuses the grand majority of his uh, ministry towards Israel, this isn't really a real threat in the Gospels. It seems to be a natural progression and fulfillment of what the Messiah comes to do and bring, which is to be the light of heaven to all of the nations, to enter into those dark places on earth. And so I'd say... I land here in this third perspective. You may find the second uh, interpretation more compelling. That's okay. There's lots of great uh, thinkers who land in, in, in both of these. But I think this interpretation makes sense of his interactions with other uh, non-Jews throughout the Gospels. It fits within this broader narrative uh, that Matthew uh, highlights between Jesus and Gentiles. And it aligns with that theme of bread, that there really is enough bread in his kingdom that the kingdom is for both Jews and non-Jews alike. So those are these three three, uh, perspectives or interpretations. Okay, what do we do with all of this, though? Okay, maybe you're like, okay, I, I kind of understand it now. What does it mean for life? Well, one of the things we can't do is try to make an application where there is no application. Jesus doesn't give us an imperative, a command. So what can we learn, though, when we look at this? Well, we can learn that Jesus loves when people put their faith in him. When people contend with him in faith, it delights him. Two times in Matthew's gospel, he will praise people's faith. And both times it is outsiders, not insiders, not even his disciples that he praises. The Roman centurion is one of them. He comes saying, Jesus, heal my paralyzed and suffering servant. And Jesus says, I'll come. And the guy says, no, you don't even have to come with me. All you have to do is say the word. Say the word, and I know you can heal my son, my servant. And Jesus responds. It says in Matthew 8, 10, When he heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. If you read on immediately after that, he tells a story about that at the end of time, there will be this feast at this table where people from as far east and as far west as possible will come and eat at this table. It's a fun little connection with the bread theme. But now we have this other story with this Canaanite woman, and similarly, as she contends with him, he praises her faith and says, Woman, you have great faith. These outsiders from other nations are the ones who have this confidence in Jesus that leads them to seek him out for help. Jesus loves when people come to him in faith. He loves that she contends with him based on his, God's character and promises. He wants that passionate response, not apathy. And it's not just uh, you know, for no reason, but rather he wants to form something in us as we seek him. I think it's because in that testing, in that contending, in the wrestling, in the coming to him over and over again, something happens to us where we're changed. But I also think there's something else here at work. Other people witness it. I was reflecting on a story, and you see that this, this moment, as she contends with Jesus and begs that he would heal her daughter, 
She's contending, but others are watching. And see, our, our, our own follow, uh, journey of following Jesus, it does get displayed for others to see. And it isn't always explicit what is at work in our lives. But those who are closest to us, more often than not, will actually see what is happening. Our family members, people we live with, our roommates, people we work with, sometimes we will not get what we pray for. You can't go and say, hey, if you have faith, it's going to happen for you. Plenty of times we pray in faith and we don't get that prayer answered. Yet the way that we re- interact and rely on Jesus is not uh, just for our desired outcome, but also how we live when we don't get what it is that we wanted. And it tells other people what we believe he's like, that we believe he's trustworthy, even when it doesn't make sense and it's confusing. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is that when you show how trustworthy he really is to others by trusting in those confusing moments where you're wondering what he's doing and all you can do is cling to his goodness and love, that is a witness. And it doesn't turn out like this. This is a great moment for this mother. We can rejoice for her. There are other moments where we pray and we don't get that answer that we wanted. But how we trust and wrestle with him and contend with him, I think it honors him. I think Jesus does love to reward faith in him. And if he doesn't do it in this life, he promises to do it in the next. Even when we get things wrong in our life, he loves to show mercy to those who call on him. Even when that criminal, like that criminal hanging next to him on the cross, that guy has gotten it wrong in life. And yet he turns to Jesus while he hangs there and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus responds to him with the greatest answer he could get. And he says, I promise you, today you will be with me in paradise. So if there's something we can draw from this is that Jesus loves when people, you and I, put our faith in him. Even when we can't fully understand what he's doing, that we trust his character, who he is and the life he's called us to, and that we cling to him, and that we contend. We're like, no, I know you are good. I don't understand what you're doing, but I will trust you. You've proven yourself true. I will continue to trust you. Trust that he is the king of the cosmos, and that he is a good king with the power and authority to heal, to set you free from all that hinders you, from living the life you were created to live, to provide all that you need to become who he redeemed you to be. Trust that he's good even when things aren't making sense, when he doesn't give you the answer that you hoped for. So, Father, we come before you now. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, who you sent for us. And your word tells us that he loved us and he gave himself up for us. That he trusted you and it led him to the cross. But because he trusted you, Lord, we have found new life and freedom. You raised him victoriously over Satan, sin, and death. And now he sits seated next to you with all authority given to him. And so, Lord, we want to look to his life and see how his way is our way. And that while we can't make sense of life in this moment, we know that the one that we seek to trust can lead us and will reward us in your good and perfect time. And so, God, we ask for grace. We ask for grace for those of us who just feel like we don't understand and it's hard to keep clinging. We ask for your comfort. We ask for your strength and resolve, Lord. Lord, we say we believe, help our unbelief. Those moments, Lord, where it just feels like it's so hard. We also ask, God, that you would give us 
your, your zeal to contend to remember the things that you have taught us about who you are, and when we come, come to you with those very things that we know, who we know you to be, and the things you've promised us in Scripture, and bring them to you. Lord, help us not to be apathetic. But we also pray, Lord, that you would help us to be a gift to one another, so that when we are discouraged, and we feel like we can't keep going, that you would help us to walk alongside of one another. And Lord, even with all of that, we just say that we want to be a people who contend with you, who bring the different things in our life the concerns, the places where we know people are suffering, people we love, people who we know need you, we want to continue to bring them to you. And so we bring them to you right now saying, you are the king. You're the healer. You're the restorer. You're the rescuer. You're the one who provides and makes a way for people. You're the one who supplies all that is needed. You are the alpha and the Omega, you're the one who takes our story and actually calls it good. And so, Lord, do your work in us and do your work in the people in our, that you, in our lives that you've placed around us. We bring them to you now, Lord. And say, just like those women said, we know you're, you have enough bread for them. There's enough bread for them, Lord. Use us to bring that to them, to make that known to them. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.